The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, we needed to take him to the emergency room. A young boy whose muscles were melting away. And I said, what does this mean? And he says, you don't want to know. Watch as his family begins a fight for his life. When the doctor said that, I just remember thinking, I can't lose him. With a little help from above. That angel that Ethan saw is here to minister to him, not to take him. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The Mueller report on the 2016 presidential campaign has been wrapped up. But still, Democrats are far from finished in their own investigations into the Trump administration. They say Attorney General William Barr is simply covering for the president. But Barr is doing some investigating of his own, including how the Russia probe got started in the first place. Jennifer Wishon brings us that story from Washington. Attorney General William Barr proved himself an adept navigator of the law on Capitol Hill this week, but Democrats aren't satisfied. This, as we learn, the FBI assigned an undercover agent to observe the Trump campaign in 2016. The New York Times reports an FBI investigator described as an attractive blonde woman using the name Azra Turk posed as a research assistant to observe Trump campaign advisor George Papadopoulos. The revelation shows the lengths the FBI took to find out if the Trump campaign was aiding Russia in its election meddling and gives fuel to the Trump administration's claims they were spied on during the campaign. Attorney General Barr said during his Senate testimony Wednesday, he's assigned a team at the Justice Department to help him review the origins of the Trump-Russia probe. Meanwhile, Democrats are fuming after Barr refused to testify before the House Judiciary Committee Thursday. He made that decision after learning committee attorneys rather than members of Congress would be questioning him. When Barr didn't show, Congressman Steve Cohen brought in a ceramic chicken on a bucket of KFC. It drew laughs, but the committee chairman threatens to hold Barr in contempt. We cannot permit him or anybody in the administration to dictate the manner in which we function. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says Barr lied about his dialogue with the Mueller team. The Attorney General of the United States of America was not telling the truth to the Congress of the United States. That's a crime. But the Justice Department calls Pelosi's accusation reckless, irresponsible and false. And it's not just Barr the Democrats are targeting. Chairman Nadler and others want to hear from a number of key witnesses in the Mueller report, like former White House counsel Dan McGahn. But the president is reserving his right to block their testimony, saying he completely cooperated with Mueller's team and that the investigations should be over. I would say it's done. The president says the Mueller report should be the final word. But for Democrats, it's a new starting point. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, get ready for two rambunctious years as the House tries to uh, open new inquiries into this. But what the New York Times is reporting is uh, unbelievable. Uh, the FBI assigned an undercover agent to go to London and directly ask, is the Trump campaign working with the Russians? And then on top of it, you have at the highest levels of the FBI a serious conversation about wiretapping in the Oval Office in order to trap President Trump. This is unprecedented in our nation's history. I don't think the FBI has ever investigated a presidential campaign. Uh, so this is, this is going to get very interesting. Well, President Trump says thinking about God helped him during the investigation into his campaign. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. The president spoke faith and protecting religious liberty during a Rose Garden ceremony for the National Day of Prayer Thursday. And as Gordon just said, he talked about how faith has helped him personally, saying he thought about God during the Robert Mueller Russia probe. People say, how do you get through that whole stuff? How do you go through those witch hunts and everything else? And you know what we do, Mike? We just do it, right? And we think about God. 
The president also announced new protections for health care workers who object to religious uh, uh, who reject rather on religious or moral grounds to taking part in procedures like abortion, sterilization and assisted suicide. Every citizen has the absolute right to live according to the teachings of their faith and the convictions of their heart. This is the bedrock of American life. To protect this heritage, my administration has strongly defended religious liberty. Clinicians and institutions wouldn't have to provide, take part in, pay for, cover, or make referrals for procedures to which they object. Well, during the Rose Garden prayer ceremony, the president also called up a speaker, the rabbi from the San Diego synagogue that was attacked by a shooter last Saturday. Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein thanked the president for his comforting words after the deadly attack, and he had a message for all of America as well. We need to go back to the basics and introduce a moment of silence in all public schools so that so that children from early childhood on could recognize that there's more good to the world, that they are valuable, that there is accountability, and every human being is created in God's image. The rabbi said he prayed and hoped that out of the darkness of the attack, a lot of good will happen. Well, as President Trump prepares to release his Israeli-Palestinian peace plan probably next month, a high-level United Nations official recently briefed the U.N. Security Council on the situation of the Palestinians. Israel was blasted for expanding Jewish communities in biblical Judea and Samaria. But Israel's U.N. ambassador, Danny Danone, said Israel's claim to the land is based on four pillars, including the Bible. From the book of Genesis to the Jewish exodus from Egypt to receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai and to the realization of God's covenant in the Holy Land of Israel, the Bible paints a consistent picture. The entire history of our people and our connection to Eretz Israel begins right here. Danone said the three other pillars for Israel's claim to the land are history, international law, and Gordon, the pursuit of peace and security. If you want to know more about those other pillars of Israel's claims to the land, we've got a special DVD for you. It's called Whose Land Is It? And it explores the history. It explores international law. It explores the various claims between the Palestinians, the Arabs, and, and the Jews to the land of Israel. Uh, it's yours if you, if you like it. It's for a gift of $10. All you have to do is Call us, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want the DVD, Whose Land Is It? Wendy? Coming up, the covert mission to take out a rogue nuclear program with the future of the Middle East riding on its outcome. One author takes us to the Syrian desert for a real-life spy story when we come back. Twelve years ago, Syria was secretly building a nuclear reactor in the desert. Israel and the United States both decided they had to stop Syria from getting nuclear weapons. And how they did that is being told for the first time in the new book, Shadow Strike. Chris Mitchell has more. On September 6, 2007, Israeli warplanes flew on one of the most important covert missions in Israel's history. Their goal? Destroy a secret Syrian nuclear reactor built by North Korea in the middle of the Syrian desert. At stake was the survival of the Jewish state and the future of the Middle East. U.S. President George W. Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney in Washington, and Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert in Jerusalem debated the high-stakes gamble of destroying the site. In his new book, Shadow Strike, Jerusalem Post editor-in-chief Yaakov Katz tells the inside story of espionage, political courage, and how Israel stopped Syria from becoming a global nuclear nightmare with historic implications. Well, Yaakov Katz, the author of Shadow Strike, joins us now from New York. And let me congratulate you on this book. It's a, it's a page turner. It reads like a spy novel, and, and yet it's true. How did you get such inside information? 
Well, I really appreciate that, Gordon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, as time passes, people start to talk. Initially, after the operation and the immediate aftermath, and I'd say for the first few years, there was complete silence on the Israeli side. And this was actually part of a, uh, a, a kind of a goal that they didn't want to talk and embarrass the president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. And they figured that if they stayed quiet, Assad would not retaliate. And that kind of worked. But we're now over 10 years later. And a few years ago, I decided to start looking into it a little deeper. It had always intrigued me. I was always curious about this amazing mission, which, like you said, brings together espionage, political courage, military might, uh, the Jewish state really standing up for what's right. And I also have to say, to some extent, there was a, probably God's hand was involved here as well. The luck that Israel was able to discover this reactor and take it out in time before it became active was really something of amazing, amazing historical proportion. Well, well tell us about the luck involved here, because it, it seems unusual uh, that they would have found it. Uh, it. Syria was doing everything they could to disguise it, had a very remote area. Uh, how did they find it? Well, that's for sh that's totally right, Gordon. What, it, Syria was building this far in the desert. They had disguised the reactor as just another plain-looking building, looked like a just this concrete structure, almost like a warehouse along the Euphrates River, not far from the border with uh, Turkey and Iraq. Uh, Israel discovered it. It had some suspicions that Syria was doing something in the nuclear realm. It saw some cooperation with North Korea, and we know that North Korea and Syria for decades has been, uh, have been working together on the development and manufacturing of ballistic missiles. But never did anyone think it would, it would also include some nuclear cooperation. And then a raid by the Mossad, Israel's equivalent of the CIA, on a hotel room in Vienna, Austria, on the room of Syria head of its own atomic agency, and they discovered on his computer photos of a nuclear reactor. In one of the photos, probably the one that really blew everyone's mind, was you saw the head of the Syrian Atomic Agency standing next to a, a man of Asian ethnicity, a, a, an individual from North Korea, who it turned out was actually one of the people who was negotiating with the United States over North Korea's nuclear program. So at the same time, that North Korea was allegedly or purportedly uh, negotiating how to stop its nuclear program, it was actually proliferating nuclear technology to another rogue state in the Middle East. Walk us through the, the story of how the head of Mossad then reveals these photographs to the CIA, to the Bush administration. Doesn't seem like uh, they were really in the, in the know on this, and here is uh, undeniable evidence North Korea is building a nuclear reactor in Syria. What, what was the reaction at the highest levels of the U.S. government? Well, in, so in April of 2007, just a few weeks after that Mossad raid that I spoke about in Vienna, the head of the Mossad at the time, an individual by the name of Mayor Dagan, who's no longer with us, he passed away a few years ago, walks into the White House for a meeting with then the National Security Advisor Steve Hadley, one of his deputies, Elliot Abrams, and a surprise guest, the Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney. And they sit down in Hadley's office, and Dagan lays out the photos, puts them on the table, and starts showing them off one by one. The Americans were blown away. They had. In, in, in their wildest dreams, they didn't imagine that North Korea, which they were currently, they were in the midst of negotiating with how to end their own nuclear program, was actually proliferating and selling this technology to Syria. Now, remember where the U.S. was back in 2007. It was fighting a war in Iraq. It was fighting a war in Afghanistan. It didn't need this trouble. President Bush had enough on his plate. And then Israel comes with this undeniable evidence, really, that, the, that Syria was building a nuclear reactor, a potential uh, nightmarish scenario not just for Israel, when, when a country on its border, which has declared that it wants Israel to disappear, is on the verge of obtaining a capability that could allow it to do that, but also for the U.S., which is facing, which is deep in the Middle East and wants to stabilize the situation, now sees another state possibly on the verge of getting nuclear weapons. This was a, uh, a nightmare of global proportions, not to mention just Syria, but also North Korea. What was it doing selling this nuclear technology? This was a huge story. Um, the U.S. doesn't really come across all that great in the book, and, and you're, you're telling the facts of the story. Uh, it seems like they were so, um, the pendulum had swung from weapons of mass destruction as being 
uh, the reason for the invasion of Iraq. And here you have visible proof that Syria is trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction. And yet the U.S. decides that they should not act, they should not take out the reactor. Tell us why. Well, I think you're right. You know, on the one hand, they don't come out looking as good as they could have come out looking, right? Uh, Bush, ultimately, there were a series of uh, debates and, and conferences. He held most of them actually in what they call the yellow oval. It's up in the residence. He wanted these conversations off the books. This, these were highly classified discussions that were taking place in the United States because Israel's prime minister at the time, Ehud Omer, came to Washington and said to President Bush, I want you to take it out. It, this, is, this is not an Israeli issue. This is a, an American problem. This is a global problem. And I think what Omer was actually thinking was that if he could get Bush, if Bush would take responsibility for what's happening in Syria, it would send a, a greater message to Iran. And it possibly would have avoided the disastrous nuclear deal that the United States under Barack Obama then reached with Iran just a few years ago. So he was, he was thinking in greater and more strategic uh, consequences. But what ultimately I think was at play was, was, like I mentioned before, Iraq, Afghanistan, the failure of the intelligence agencies in the United States to accurately uh, determine what was happening in Iraq when it came to, came to weapons of mass destruction. And I think there was some fear within, among some members of the U.S. administration, particularly Condoleezza Rice and Bob Gates, Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense at the time, who felt that Israel might have had too much influence over Bush, and therefore they were pushing for a more diplomatic uh, solution to all of this. The one person who actually stood up, I think, and really, you know, when I look at this book and I came in, I tried to look at everything objectively. I had uh, some thoughts about what I, what, what I felt towards the Bush administration, what I felt about Ehud Olmert, who we all know eventually went to jail for corruption charges. But really, uh, Dick Cheney, for example, stood up and said, this is, this is something that America needs to take care of. This is an issue that America needs to show responsibility and uh, determination. And Olmert, for all of his flaws and failures, which we then saw him eventually, like I mentioned, go to jail, stood up when he got that phone call in July of 2007 from President Bush, who said, look, I'm not going to attack. Prime Minister Olmert said to him, this is unacceptable, and if you won't do it, I will have to do what's right for the state of Israel. So you really saw also a lesson, I would say, not just in espionage, in military might, but also in what statesmanship is really supposed to be like. Well, it, it is. And one of the things I admire about the book is you give it that larger context. Take us back to the Israeli bombing of the reactor in Iraq and the, the launch of uh, what Menachem Begin started, the Begin Doctrine. Uh, why is that so important for Israel's security? Well, you're right. Back in 1981, when Iraq, uh, under Saddam Hussein, was building the Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad, Menachem Begin, who was very much—and we just had Holocaust Remembrance Day yesterday in Israel—Menachem Begin was very much scarred by the Holocaust. He lost almost his entire family there, and he felt that Israel cannot allow a state that declares as an intention to destroy the Jewish state, to destroy the state of Israel, to obtain weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons. And he sent fighter jets all the way to Iraq in what was believed to be an impossible mission to take out the Osirak reactor, the first time in the history of the world that one state, Israel, bombed and destroyed a nuclear reactor of another state. I think that the Begin Doctrine, as it's become known, is, is of extreme importance for the state of Israel. We are a tiny country. We don't have strategic depth. A bomb, a nuclear weapon goes off in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, that will have a adverse impact on the entire state of Israel. It's that small, smaller than, than about the size of New Jersey. And for that reason, no country that declares its intention to destroy or wipe Israel off the map can be allowed to get those weapons. That included Iraq. That included Syria back in 2007. And while Iran today complies with the nuclear deal, the problem with this nuclear deal is that when it's up in 10, you know, now it's already about seven, eight years, they will just be a, a jump weeks away from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And that is something that unfortunately Israel cannot live with. Israel cannot allow a country like Iran, which works daily to weaken, to undermine Israel, to obtain that type of weapon. And I think that be what Omer showed was that that Begin doctrine is still very much alive and strong. Well, there's another problem here, and, and you pointed out that one of the uh, after effects of 2007 is that it showed North Korea, it showed Iran, it showed Russia, 
that there aren't any consequences. Here, North Korea violated every international treaty there is and built a nuclear reactor in Syria for the express purpose of building a nuclear weapon, and yet they suffered no consequences. Uh, are, are we now in a more dangerous position because the U.S. failed to act? I think you're right, Gordon. You know, one of the things that struck me about this story is that while it took place, like you said in the beginning, 12 years ago, it's still so relevant today. It's relevant today because of Iran, and it's relevant today because of Syria, what's still happening there with the civil war, and also because of North Korea. Let's remember what happened. In 2006, in October, North Korea tested for the first time a nuclear weapon. And George Bush stood in the White House, the president, and said, this is terrible, this kid's unacceptable, and if they transfer nuclear weapons or technology, that will already be a major threat to the United States. Well, a few months later, that's what they were caught red-handed doing. And despite that, they paid no price. After the reactor was destroyed, the United States went to Beijing, uh, a representative of the U.S., uh, Ambassador Chris Hill, met with the North Korean nuclear negotiator, showed him those photos that the Mossad had brought back to the White House in April. And just like they were taken out, they were put back away. North Korea, the six-party talks, those negotiations with the Koreans continued. Not only that, but Bush and, and Condoleezza Rice lifted the, the, the uh, declaration of North Korea as a state uh, of terrorism back in, in 08, only to be returned by President Bush just a couple years ago. So you saw that not only were they not punished, they were almost rewarded. And then when you look back and you see under the Obama administration, starting in 09, North Korea goes ahead and tests four more nuclear weapons. We think of where we are today, fascinating what the world could have potentially look like had back in 2007, they had been made to pay a price. And I think that that's one of the big questions that this book leaves us asking is, it's a what if. What if North Korea had been punished back in 2007? Would we be facing such an existential threat? The United States, Israel, the entire world, like we are right now, just, not just in the Middle East, but also in Asia, where North Korea continues to possess nuclear weapons and continues to destabilize that region. Well, let's take you out of the Middle East. Let's take you out of 2007. Let's take you into today's headlines. What do you think about Tariq El Asami, the vice president of Venezuela, uh, the head of their intelligence service? Uh, I think most Americans don't understand his ties to Iran, his ties to Hezbollah. Uh, what do you think is going on there? And should we be absolutely alarmed that Iran has close ties with Venezuela? Iran has had close ties with Venezuela for a number of years. This started back when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the president of Iran back in 2005 and on, and when Hugo Chavez was still in charge of uh, Venezuela. They used to have flights that would travel back and forth between Venezuela and Iran carrying weapons and cash and, and narcotics, or who knows what those, what those planes were carrying. I think this is a great strategic threat, not just to Israel, of course, which faces off with Iran in the Middle East, but to the United States, just uh, not far away from the southern border, you have a presence of Iran, a presence of Hezbollah. I'll remind you, Gordon, and you, you saw this as well, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State here in the United States, just a few weeks ago, spoke about Hezbollah's presence in South America. You know, when we look at what Hezbollah has done over the years, in 1992, they bombed the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. In 1994, they bombed the Jewish Community Center in that same city. They've operated before throughout the, throughout the continent. They have the capabilities. They have the support of the Iranian. We see what's happening in Venezuela right now with the destabilization there. We can only imagine what role the Iranians might be playing in providing logistics, weapons, technical support to Maduro, and what that could potentially mean for the rest of the continent, and no less for the United States. Well, I'm, I hope that will be in a future book, and I hope there's a happy ending to it. If we, if we need to learn the lesson of the history, the lesson of 2007. Well, congratulations on the book. It's a masterwork. It's called Shadow Strike. It's available wherever books are sold. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much. Wendy. Coming up, a visitor in the ICU, and this one wasn't wearing medical scrubs. And he said, no, don't leave, don't leave. And I said, Ethan, everything's okay. We're, we're right here, mom and dad's right here. I felt like, he was watching an angel. He was afraid that it was leaving him, it wasn't covering him anymore. 
Watch a recovery that even doctors are calling amazing. Plus, we'll be praying for you, so don't go away. Well, throughout this week, the staff of CBN Regent and Operation Blessing have gathered together for a special time of prayer and worship. We've also been lifting up the needs of you, our partners. Yesterday, we had the chance to hear an encouraging message from author Lisa Robertson. My mother told me about this minister from Virginia Beach with a television show. And I hate to tell him, but I had never heard of Pat Robertson. <laughs> I just wanted to just tell you that your fearless leader and his wife are just wonderful warriors for the kingdom of God. And, and I just want you to keep praying for them because they do a great job. God will make known the path of life. In his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forever. Psalm 16, 11. The promise there is that God has a path for all of us and He's gonna show it to us. And He wants us to find the path of our life and He wants us to walk with Him on it. And I can be filled with joy by being close to the Lord, by being in that place where I know that He cares for me, that He hears my prayers, that He is speaking His truth to my heart and that He's walking with me. And that is, that is the joy. That's so good. We love Lisa. That's Pat's grand uh, daughter-in-law. Well, today is the final day of our annual week of prayer. So if you have a prayer need and you want us to intercede on your behalf, now is the time to let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com. You can also live stream our chapel services. Just head over to our website at noon Eastern time. Gordon? Well, Ethan Conley came down with a rare virus, and it started attacking his muscles. Doctors say when that happens, there's no end to it. By all accounts, the prognosis was grim, and Ethan's parents worried that death was coming for their child. He was a very rambunctious young boy, um, fearless, could not sit still. He was always bouncing a ball, climbing a tree. He had the best smile. He could light up a room. The evening of January 8th, 2010, Rebecca and Jabin Conley came home from a basketball game with their children, unaware that their lives were about to change drastically. We got home and uh, put the kids to bed and probably about 1.30 in the morning, Ethan began throwing up. And then Saturday morning, he had a low grade fever. At that point, we didn't really think it was anything other than just a low-grade flu-type symptoms and figured he would be fine. But Ethan was not fine. In fact, he had contracted viral myositis with rhabdomyolysis, a rare and potentially fatal virus that mimics the flu and attacks muscle tissue. We needed to take him to the emergency room. He was on the morphine drip um, and they could only give it to him every two hours. I didn't sleep at all that night and I would just shake his, I'd grab his heels and I would just kind of just move him just like this. And that would soothe him enough to get him through to that next hour. And it was at that point where they had diagnosed him with uh, the viral myositis. Over the next two days, his condition worsened quickly. CPK level is a level which is measured uh, when you have uh, you know, mu muscle breakdown. Uh, and when the breakdown occurs, the level starts going up high. Normally, it's less than 200. And he started with like 16,000 and then started going up to, to around 700,000. I, I said, what does this mean? <clears throat> and he says, you don't want to know. When the doctor said that, I just remember thinking, I can't lose him. Just. I just couldn't even picture my life without him. Once it attacks the muscles, um, it's just, there is no end to it. Uh, when you start looking into the virus in the, in the muscles, they're gone. The muscles were melting away. The Conleys began contacting friends and family on Facebook, at their home church, and all across the country, asking people to pray for Ethan to be spared. Our prayers went into a, a different mode at that point. We began reaching out to our church family, telling everybody to pray. We don't know what's going on, but it appears 
that uh, Ethan's fighting for his life. We got the news and we decided, okay, all right, this is what we have. Now our God is bigger than this. So we need to just draw on that. So that's what we did. The staff also warned that if he did survive, there would likely be long-term side effects. Usually you will have kidney dysfunction, um, some residual kidney problems, muscle problem, gait problem, uh, heart problem. Ethan was just laying there and he started looking at something and following it out the room. And he said, no, don't leave, don't leave. And I said, Ethan, everything's okay. We're, we're right here, mom and dad's right here. And he said, no, I don't want you to leave me. And so at that point, I felt like he was watching an angel and it was leaving the room and he was afraid that it was leaving him, it wasn't covering him anymore. Fear gripped me. I, I thought maybe it was death that had come for him. Javen and Rebecca knew Ethan's life was in God's hands. They couldn't find a pulse on him and it was getting really, really dim. I just wanted to look at Ethan and look at every part of him, try to remember and capture everything about him in case I lost him. But I went into the meditation room and poured out my heart to God and said, God, if you take Ethan, I will serve you. And if you leave him here with us, I will serve you no matter what. You're a good God. I had a friend from our church that came, Jason Elliott is his name, and he said, and that angel that Ethan saw is here to minister to him, not to take him. And he, Jason didn't know anything about the situation. I felt a peace about it. I felt like um, God was just letting us know that he was there with us and taking care of things. Within 48 hours of, uh, of uh, the breakdown, he started recovering. It just was amazing. The Conleys knew they had witnessed a miracle. At my time in the ICU, I don't remember a whole lot, but I do remember seeing two angels, and I could tell that everything was going to be all right from that point on. Not only did Ethan recover, there was no permanent damage to any of his organs. He recently accepted a basketball scholarship to Ashland University. It's amazing for people that I didn't even know that were praying for me, and they just kept believing that God would perform a miracle, and they definitely played a part in this miracle. We felt that the staff and the doctors and Dayton Children's was were godsends to us. When they were binding together with us and praying with us, that just made our, our faith rise that much higher. We've had opportunities to share our testimony, share the goodness of God. Things in this life aren't always gonna go right. And we're certainly sensitive and aware of situations that don't end up in a happy place like Ethan is currently. But the most important thing is to focus on that peace that God can give. We're going to have trials, we're gonna have tribulations. The only way to get through those situations is, is to have a foundation in Christ that can get you through. Those are words to live by. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Will you let him overcome the world for you today? All you have to do is believe in Him, that no matter what happens, your trust is in Him, your peace comes from Him, your eternity comes from Him. He is watching over you. He has set His angels to watch over you. All you have to do is believe in all of that. And when you do, anxiety goes away, fear goes away, perfect love comes in, and you know that you can trust Him and you can trust him for a miracle. Now it's time to pray, and we've got some prayer requests that have come in on our week of prayer. Here's a prayer for God's blessing and protection on Israel, its people, and its leadership. Here's one to be healed of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The medications are not working. And here's to be healed of a pressure that puts, uh, um, I don't know what meningioma is, but it puts great pressure on my eye. What do you have? 
Uh, here's one, to be healed of painful neuropathy in my feet and my whole body, to be healed of metast metastatic breast cancer that has gone to my brain. I need favor with Social Security. I can't work due to illness and no income. Comfort, guidance, and financial provision after the death of my loved one. Let's pray. Join with us. Let's create a great circle of prayer and realize God wants to answer your prayer. Amen. Lord, we just lift the, these needs. Yes, God. We lift those who need healing. We need, lift those that, that need deliverance. We lift those who need protection. And Lord God, we just ask that you would release your ministering angels, that, that, that heaven would come. And we ask that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we look to heaven, we see that no one is in trouble. No one is in danger. No one is sick. No one is grieving. No one is poor. No one is lonely. And so, Lord, we know that that is your will. And so we ask that your will would be done on earth. Lord, protect your people, Israel. And we ask for the United States as well. Heal our land. Our divisions seem insurmountable, but with you, all things are possible. Turn our leaders, Lord God, turn them to you so that we could be one nation under God. And now for those who have requested healing, we just ask that you would reach forth your hand and yes. touch yes. now. Thank you, God. And we say out loud to their bodies, be healed and be made whole by the stripes of Jesus Christ. The price has been paid. He took the penalty for all sin, all transgression. He bore away our infirmities. He has carried away our diseases. If he's done it all, we don't have to carry it anymore. So we speak healing and restoration now in Jesus name. In Jesus name. When did God give you something? There's someone that is, you're just so afraid. You're almost afraid to leave your house. God is going to deliver you from that spirit of fear as you praise him, as you put on the worship music and you lift your hands. That spirit is leaving in Jesus name. Someone you got crippling arthritis in your legs. It's in both knees and uh, primarily affecting the left knee. And God is just restoring your movement. He's restoring your strength. He's giving you back that movement. You just felt something go through that knee. In Jesus' name, be healed, be set free. Someone else, you've got a problem with your right kidney, and God is healing. He's restoring. He's restoring full function. Go back and get tested and realize all of that is healed. All of that pain is leaving you right now. In Jesus' name. Someone you're worried about your home going into foreclosure, stand on the word of God and you're about to see a miracle. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. thank you. We thank you. You are the answer to every human need. And we receive it now. We receive your salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have been healed, let us know. Uh, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. Uh, we're here for you 24 hours a day. We believe in prevailing prayer. So anytime you need prayer, just pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Wendy? Amen. Well, coming up, the pastor of one of the largest and fastest growing churches in the United Kingdom and who's preached the gospel to the queen herself. Bishop John Francis joins us live when we come back. Well, welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Conservative commentator Stephen Moore is out. The president announcing Thursday that Moore withdrew his bid to serve on the Federal Reserve Board. In a tweet, Trump said Moore was a, quote, truly fine person who ultimately decided to withdraw from the process. Moore also released a statement saying the unrelenting attacks on my character have become untenable for me and my family. Moore had been losing GOP support in the Senate over past controversial remarks about women. While many mothers fleeing the crisis in Venezuela are driven by desperation for their children, young mothers caring for babies are especially desperate for formula and diapers which they can't find as conditions in Venezuela worsen. CBN's Operation Blessing, though, is helping the most vulnerable infants and toddlers. 
OB set up a baby feeding station in La Carpa, Colombia. These stations provide formula and fresh milk along with medical treatment. One mom said many mothers can't provide breast milk or bottles for their babies, and she thanked Operation Blessing for providing volunteers to help Venezuelans and Colombians. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing and how you can help by visiting its website, ob.org. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Be a part of it. Be a part of taking the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. How do you do that? Join the Superbook Club, and for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest Superbook Explorer, which has two episodes on it. This one is the story of Joshua and Caleb, and then the story of Peter's escape. And it, you get so much more in, in this DVD. You get all the Bible background. You get the archaeology that went into the episodes. And then most importantly, the theology of the episode. How does this show God's plan of salvation? It's all yours when you join the club. So if you'd like to, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Let's go over to Wendy. Thanks, Gordon. Well, you don't have to look very hard to find stories about how Christianity is dying in Europe. Church attendance is on the decline and fewer people are identifying themselves as followers of Jesus. Standing athwart these trends, Bishop John Francis, the founder and pastor of England's Ruach City Church. Bishop John Francis started Ruach City Church in England 20 years ago with 18 faithful members. Today, his church is one of the largest and fastest growing in the UK, with over 6,000 people in regular attendance in three locations. He is uncompromising in his faith. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ today. And means serious business for God. Sometimes people want to wait till things happen to prepare. But what you have to do is prepare yourself for where you're going and start getting happy for things that has not manifested yet. Oh, that's good. Well, Bishop John Francis is here with us now with hopefully a lot more of that. Welcome to the 700 <laughs> Oh, thank you. It's an honor to be here today. And your very first time on the show. My very first time. It's quite amazing because you watch this at home and now, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh, I'm in 700 Club <laughs> CBN. Yes, thank you. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Well, why has the UK, UK seen such a decline in Christianity over the decades, Bishop? I think um, the UK have become secularized and, and, and a backslidden country. As we know, that's where the Bible was and most of the miss missionaries um, came from the UK. And I think, unlike America, you still, you still see politicians talk about their faith. Um, right. in, in the UK, they don't want to. There's been a lot of light about in, being exclusive, trying to involve everyone and every religion. Um, even the king has changed where he used to be the defender of the faith. He's now changed it well. I shouldn't say he's the king. That's Prince um, William. Uh, 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 Charles, oh, Charles. Charles says that he wants to be the defender of faiths. So mm -hmm. uh, I think because of that now, we've seen that the Christianity sort of uh, kind of taken a back seat. But God is still doing some great things. There are young ones and people like us who God has brought to the country. I'm the next generation. My parents were from Jamaica okay. and they came after the war. Right. And, you know, the gospel was brought to the West Indies. We feel like we're the seed being brought back mm. to the UK to bring back the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that. Well, Prince Charles may be saying, you know, he's defender of the faiths, but Queen Elizabeth has always identified herself as a Christian, right? And yes. And you've had the chance to preach to her? Yes, I, I've been, I've met her. I've met the, the royal family from time to time. One of the great things, she has um, sometimes what we call a, a garden party where all the bishops from the Anglicans and I was there and that was amazing. So you see <laughs> bishops from all over the world in a garden and, and met her and um, she, she's a staunch, you know, believer, yes. Well, despite what we hear about the decline in Christianity, Something's happening at your church, at Ruach Church. What are, you, what are you doing different? What is your church doing different? I think we're being more relevant. Um, the church now of Jesus Christ has got to be um, a church that speaks to today. And we have a fantastic outreach program. We reach people who are lost. Um, we started out in sort of South London and most of our people were ex-gang members, ex-prostitutes who got saved. Now different locations have different expressions. Now our Northwest locations is in a place where a lot of Muslims are. Uh, we, so we have a lot of Iraqis, 
Iranians. And I now have um, a fellowship that goes there. And one of my, two of my elders, one of them is from Syria and the other one is um, from Dubai. And so we're seeing these people's life being changed. So I think when the church begins to recognize that there is a field out there, mm. people are hungry and wanting to know Christ, just need to make the gospel relevant. And you started with 18 members. Yes. Now you've seen ex explosive growth, really. Definitely. How many people now? Well, we're going over 8,000 in all our locations. Um, we actually, we said that we had three, but we're now to five locations. Yeah. And um, God just blessing. So we have local elders that look after those locations. And I kind of travel throughout the day, about two, three of them per day to minister at. What are some of the ways that you're seeing God move in your church and and throughout London? First of all, we believe in deliverance. And um, I believe that sometimes people are being captivated by the powers of the enemy, mm. causing them to do things that's not natural. And I think if we preach the power of Jesus Christ, people getting healed, people getting saved, people getting delivered from addiction, that becomes a testimony. In fact, you don't have to say anything. Their life becomes a testimony for people to know about. How did you actually start your church? Well, it's interesting. I, I belonged, my father was like um, a pioneer of the Pentecostal church in the UK after the war. It was Church of God in Christ. He was a, an elder. And so I felt the Lord was calling me to reach a different generation. So I left and it was a little bit controversial at the time because <laughs> oh. uh, it was like you're leaving the established church sure. and what have you. And so I, I, I was obeying God. And if I be honest with you, I didn't know it was going to be like what it was. Mm. I felt like when I started, it was all new because people was coming to me were real people off the streets who had serious problems and I had to ask God for answers. Mm. In fact, a lot of the things that we did, I, I, I had to ask God, am I doing it right? Tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. Because I was dealing with serious challenges. I remember one time I went to my father and said, Dad, I'm dealing with this. And he says, well, you better ask God because I don't know how to give you the answer for this. And so I think that what God did was allowed us to sort of reach people who were unreachable at that time. And, mm. and now we just see that um, ministry has grown. We have got a lot of relevant, we have outreach ministries. We, we do a lot of things for, for, um, to minister to gang people. Um, we we um, have feeding programs. And those people, yeah. those who have been forgiven of much, love much, oh, and become yes. some of the most wonderful uh, believers and followers of Jesus, don't they? they? They're the ones who will testify. You don't have to say anything. They will talk about how their life has been changed. And what also happens is when other people who knew them turn around and say, oh my gosh, what happened to you? There's oh, some yeah. change in your life. They're a walking it, epistle. Exactly, read yeah. of men. Um, your church has an unusual name, Ruach. It's yes. a Hebrew. I had to look it up last <laughs> night because um, I know what it means now. What does it mean? Ruach is it's a Hebrew word for spirit. Now, here's the funny thing. I, one time I met a rabbi and I sort of said, um, he goes, oh, Ruach, Hakodesh, the name of your church. And I goes, yeah, it means the breath of God, the wind of God. I'm telling a rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Silly me, but I felt good about it. And he said, no, he, he, what he did, let me speak. Oh. And he goes, not only is it the breath of God, the wind of God, or the spirit of God, it's the atmosphere of God. Wow. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, that just Ooh. is powerful. The Bible says um, that the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, of Ruach, and then God said, let there be light. Now, when you hear him say the atmosphere of God moved upon the face of the waters, it sounds something completely different. So we believe that's what the Lord called us. And our thing is we're moving with the atmosphere of God, the Ruach, the breath of God. And um, we can only say what's happened in our church has been the spirit of God. Amazing. Doesn't get much better than that. Yes. Well, we are delighted about this. Well, Bishop John Francis, thank you so much for your insights. He has a lot of resources, too, uh, that you will want to look for on our website. Just go to CBN.com, books and CDs. He's also going to be uh, wrapping up our week of prayer as our featured speaker in today's chapel. You can live stream that event by going to our website, CBN.com, and that is at noon Eastern. You don't want to miss that. God bless you, and thank you thank so you. much. God bless England. God Good. bless you. Thank you. <laughs> God bless the queen. <laughs> all right. We leave you now with these words from Psalm 103:2. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. Well, from all of us here, for Gordon and all of us, thank you so much for watching. It's been a great week. Don't forget to tune in at noon on CBN.com to see more from Bishop Francis. You don't want to miss that. God bless you.